Hi all, my name's Neil. I'm one of the leading engineers on the dendrite in the PCP matrix project at Element, and my talk today is called Pine Cones and Dendrites, which will be a bit of an update and some light storytelling about peer-to-peer -peer matrix, as well as our plans for further development. First of all, I'd like to start by taking the opportunity to talk about Dendrite, our second generation matrix home server, written in Go. We picked up work again on Dendrite at the end of 2019 after a couple of years of relative inactivity. Dendrite was originally planned as the go-to home server for large-scale matrix deployments. It's built using a microservice architecture that can optionally scale components across different machines, which sounded ideal at a time that the public matrix.org server was experiencing routine growth pains. Dendrite is very important in the P2P matrix space. It's the home server that we use for all of our P2P development, experimentation, and demos. We've also seen increasing engagement from the community and a number of excellent contributions, and we finally decided in October 2020 to move Dendrite out of Alpha and into Beta. Dendrite is usable today. It still has some bugs and it still has some missing features, but the core matrix experience is there and it's functional. At the end of December, we also took the step to build our own public Dendrite instance at dendrite.matrix.org, which is open for public registration. If you want to see how using Dendrite feels without having to build your own, this is the way to do it. As well as being able to scale up, we've proven that Dendrite can also very efficiently scale down, which has made it the perfect testing ground for our peer-to-peer -peer experiments. It can run lean enough to make single-user deployments on low-power devices sustainable. At FOSTEM last year, we announced the P2P Matrix project. Our goal was simple, to move matrix home servers out of data centers and right onto end user devices instead. It's an ambitious project with ambitious goals, but our belief is that peer-to-peer -peer matrix is the next logical evolution that will take your data away from remote location and bring it back into your own hands on your own devices. But why are we doing this? Today, Matrix is an open federation of home servers, the idea being that Matrix is decentralized. A user can pick a home server of their own choosing, or even run their own, and still talk to users on other servers. The Matrix Federation currently homes over 100,000 users, but there are still some pretty significant issues. The first being that, to truly embrace the spirit of decentralization, you shouldn't really have to rely on someone else to run a home server for you. Building a home server isn't terribly difficult, but it's certainly not simple enough for the majority of everyday users, especially since they need to be maintained, upgraded, fed, watered, etc. The net result here is that we tend to see a lot of users centralizing around the matrix.org home server and a small number of others, either because it's not obvious that there's an alternative, or because it isn't really easy to know what to look out for when you're actually choosing a home server. And that's not great when we're supposed to be encouraging people to avoid centralization. Users also bring lots of questions about what information is being stored on their chosen home server. Will their private chats be visible to the owner of that home server? What metadata is collected? And we continuously watch as companies try and take advantage of user data. Most recently, the tighter integration between WhatsApp and Facebook. And privacy is becoming more and more important and much closer to the public eye as a result. And finally, there's still a fairly big problem that a user might register on a home server that's run by someone else, and then one day that home server might just disappear from under them without any warning, and there's nothing that they can do about it. So one of the big questions facing the P2P project was what it means to be a decentralized system versus a distributed one. As we've seen, it can be quite difficult to promise decentralization when the path of least resistance is decentralized. And the matrix.org home server is testament to that, since it's become a rather accidental point of centralization, even though it was never intended that way. Pushing further into the distributed territory forces us to think carefully about how to level the playing field, removing obvious points of centralization and making it easier for users to get started with matrix in the process. Over the last year, we've built not just one, but four separate demos as a means to explore what peer-to-peer -peer matrix might look like. We picked different technologies and targeted different platforms as a part of these demos, and I'd like to talk next about what those demos look like. In each of these demos today, the client server API remains unchanged, so in theory, it's possible to take any existing matrix client and use it with P2P, just as you do with an existing home server today. 
The first demo we built for FOSDEM last year was the Dendrite demo libp2b binary. It supports local discovery of peers on the same network, and servers are identified by their public key. You can publish rooms into a directory, which can also be discovered by nearby users, and you can join those rooms and chat away as normal. However, this demo is very limited. It doesn't work over the internet, or even outside of a single subnet for that matter and it doesn't have any glue, like a DHT, to actually help to discover other nodes elsewhere in the world. Even if it did, libp2p still appears to be quite centered around the idea of nodes being globally routable to one another, which isn't always necessarily going to be the case in areas with limited connectivity. The second demo was a bit of an evolution of the first, but instead of building a standalone binary and having to run the process yourself, we took it a step further and asked ourselves, what it would look like if Dendrite was running right there in the web browser. And we achieved this by compiling Dendrite as WebAssembly. We used libp2p again for this demo, but running in the web browser has a number of limitations, including not being able to access the usual host networking that we were able to leverage with the first demo. So there's no multicast peer discovery for starters. To work around this, we built a libp2p rendezvous server to allow users to discover each other over the internet, which effectively acts as a traffic relay. This is an unfortunate point of centralization, and it isn't remotely compatible with our real project goals, but what it helped us to prove is that we can run a full matrix home server right there in the browser, and the user doesn't really need to do anything special for it to work, aside from just showing up with a supported browser. With WebSockets, WebRTC, and friends, it's very likely that we would be able to extend this model further in the future without having to rely on centralized rendezvous points. The third demo is very much like the first one. It's another standalone binary that you can run on your own machine, but instead of libp2p, we swapped it out for Yggdrasil. Yggdrasil is a very different animal to libp2p, because instead of assuming direct global routability over the internet to all other nodes over the network, Yggdrasil instead builds up an overlay network, where all nodes are basically equal participants, and any node with more than one peer connection can forward traffic on behalf of other nodes. It's still highly experimental, and it comes with some problems, which I'll discuss shortly. But it gives us something that the libp2p demo didn't have, which is the ability to grow beyond the local network by connecting to other Yggdrasil nodes over the internet. Furthermore, existing Yggdrasil nodes don't require any modifications whatsoever in order to act as suitable routers for our demo. And finally, there's the most recent demo, which we built on iOS, which is an attempt to explore what P2P matrix might feel like if it was running on a mobile device. To do this, we cross-compiled Dendrite for ARM and we spent a little bit of time embedding it into Element iOS itself, of which there's now a P2P variant available on TaskFlight. This demo actually started off being based on Yggdrasil, but more recently it's become the testbed for our own research project named Pinecone. The iOS demo has one special magic trick which none of the other demos had, which is called AWDL, and that's that it's the ability to communicate with other nearby devices using the same demo, regardless of whether or not the devices are on the same Wi-Fi network, regardless of whether or not they have any mobile data connectivity at all. It's a truly ad hoc demo, you can take a handful of devices out into the woods, and as long as they're within wireless range of each other, they'll be able to communicate and relay on behalf of each other, and the network topology builds up automatically. In some ways, this is very close to the P2P dream, completely zero configuration networking, and it sort of works today. On the left-hand side, you'll see the iPad display. On the right-hand side, you'll see the iPhone one. These two devices are physically close to each other. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the P2P app on the left hand side. This has only been opened once before, basically to just quickly register an account on the local Dendrite instance, which is actually embedded into the app directly. And you'll see that I've created a test room. And at the top left, you'll see a piece of text that says no connected peers. I'm going to go ahead and open it on the right hand device. And you'll see straight away that both sides have now detected peers. It shows two peers in this instance because one of them is over the local Wi-Fi network and the other one is using AWDL, but effectively it's just two connections between the same pair of devices. And I should be able to go into the room directory here on the right hand side, browse directory and find test room. So at that point I will join. 
and it shows on the left hand side that the iPhone has joined. So I'll send hi. And this appears on the left. In both of these instances, the devices are communicating directly. There's no centralized home server being used or anything like that. This is Dendrite running directly on the iPad, communicating with Dendrite running directly on the iPhone. I briefly named drop Pinecone there, so at this point I'd like to formally introduce Pinecone. Pinecone is a research project of ours to develop an overlay routing scheme for PTP matrix. And I'd like to talk a little bit about why we're bothering to develop something like this ourselves, rather than just using something off the shelf. Pinecone is heavily inspired by Yggdrasil, and it shares much of the same design. It works by building a global spanning tree, of which all nodes are a part of, and then assigns them a set of coordinates based on their position relative to the root of the spanning tree. These coordinates are basically the path taken from the root down to the given node. The distributed hash table is used to assist one node to find the coordinates of another node. A core design choice in Yggdrasil is that it is a greedy routing scheme, which is where every node on the network makes a forwarding decision based on local knowledge only. The protocol only allows forwarding traffic to appear, which takes it closer to its destination. We did successfully produce demos using Yggdrasil as a transport for matrix federation traffic, but there are some problems with it. The biggest of which being that all the network locators being relative to parent nodes makes the network fragile when topology changes, and that can happen for a variety of reasons. In this case, it's possible that parts of the network will need to renumber with new sets of coordinates if one of the parent nodes or the network root node disappears. And when this happens, traffic across the network is disrupted, and in that short period of time when the network is trying to reconverge, nodes can no longer depend on their local routing knowledge to forward traffic properly. Then when the network does eventually reconverge, we have to start searching the DHT again for the new coordinates for the nodes that we want to talk to, and that can result in quite a lot of protocol traffic, especially on a big network. In addition to that, we've also seen cases where unstable network links can result in storms of constant coordinate changes, which can render the network unusable for a period of time. The Yggdrasil project is exploring protocol changes to mitigate problems like this, but in the meantime, we've also been trying to work on some mitigations for these problems. Pinecone is our attempt to explore whether we can improve upon the Yggdrasil design by either using source routing, virtual ring routing, or some combination of the two, in cases where the standard greeting routing from Yggdrasil fails. So far, Pinecone has support for source routing, which allows pathfinding between two Pinecone nodes to work out the exact path through the network to take to reach another node, and then reusing it exactly. This gives us some resilience against the coordinates changing, as a source routed path will be unaffected, although it does add additional fragility in the form of the path being altogether broken if a node on the path disappears. In practice, Pinecone will be able to run additional pathfinding in the background to ensure that the most optimal path is being taken and to keep backup paths cached in case the active one fails. We're also planning to investigate virtual ring routing, which more closely marries the routing information base with the distributed hash table or DHT. This will work by having nodes find their nearest key space neighbors on the network and maintaining these paths so that traffic can be forwarded in the correct direction based on the target public key and we take shortcuts every time we intersect another one of those paths that takes us actually closer. This rather heavily reduces the reliance on the coordinate system of the spanning tree altogether, but most importantly, it has another side effect, which is that it shows really promising results in node mobility tests, which helps particularly in cases where devices are moving around a lot or their connectivity changes a lot. Pinecone's overlay routing is designed to solve the problem of how our P2P matrix nodes will find and communicate with each other, but this is ultimately only solving one part of the problem. Today's matrix federation protocol is full mesh, and that's a pretty big problem for us. Regular home servers today often have good connectivity and good uptime, and it's reasonably likely that there will be lots of users on a single home server, so it isn't so much of a problem there, but we don't have any of these guarantees in the P2P world. It's very likely there'll be lots of single user home servers, and they'll probably be offline often, and they might not have great connectivity even when they are online. 
Therefore, it will be a secondary goal of Pinecone to assist in building per-room topologies so that we can effectively gossip events to other online servers in the room and to identify when servers are offline for the purposes of storing and forwarding. We'll be working on P2V Matrix a lot throughout this coming year, so keep an eye out for more demos. I've talked a fair bit about how we can get P2P nodes to communicate with one another. And I've also talked about the kind of changes that would need to happen to the Matrix Federation protocol, but there's still a fairly big elephant in the room, and that's how we handle user identities in the P2P world. Our early stage proposal is that a Matrix spec change proposal called Portable Identities. In the Matrix world today, user identities are very closely associated with the home server that the user registered on. In my case, that's matrix.org, and that's right there in my matrix ID. But this fundamentally goes against the model that we have in mind for P2P matrix, which is that if we want to bring the logic of home servers closer to the end user, perhaps even running on their own computers or devices, then we need to be prepared for users having multiple devices and therefore multiple home servers. So this opens up two questions. One is how we will handle a single user identity across multiple home servers. And the other is how users will be able to get and keep human-friendly aliases like today, instead of having to deal with public keys. Now, our goal here is to factor out the concept of a user identity so that there's no longer a built-in assumption that a user ID is granted by a specific home server. In MSC 2787, our proposal is that this will be a cryptographic key pair, and the user will be able to use this key pair not just to prove their identity to a home server, but also to sign attestations that grant home servers to act on behalf of that user for a specific amount of time. When I say act on behalf of, what I mean is that the home server will be authorized to send messages into the room for a user, handle invites, and things that a regular home server would do today on behalf of its registered users. A user will be able to choose to not renew an attestation at any time, at which point the home server will lose its power to act on behalf of that user if, for instance, it was discovered to be malicious or the user changed their mind about where they want their data to be held, etc. In addition to this, it's not reasonable to expect that mobile devices or desktop PCs will have DNS names, but we do expect that matrix home servers that are static in data centers will continue to exist, even if they are also speaking the P2P dialect. We envisage that these home servers will be able to grant a user a friendly alias based on the server's DNS name in exchange for an attestation. And this will pretty much take the form of a directory lookup where you ask the server about an alias, similar to how room aliases work today, and it will return information about the user's cryptographic identity and attestations, as well as being able to then handle incoming events for that user. And that means that the user won't have to deal with handing out public keys and it also potentially opens up the option for a user to have multiple aliases from more than one home server instead of just one like they do today, which grants them some portability. Finally, we'll need home servers that a user belongs to to be able to backfill from each other and replicate the user's room memberships and perhaps some history so that the user can pick up any of their devices and see the same rooms with the same timelines. It's important that the user doesn't lose everything or if they lose one device as well. So attesting multiple home servers or devices will not just serve for a consistent user experience across those devices, but it also serves as a form of backup. MSC 2787 as a proposal is still incomplete, and there's still quite a lot to figure out, but this should be the final piece of the puzzle that would make P2P usable. We'll be continuing to post more updates on our P2P and our Dendrite channels, so please feel free to join us on those on Matrix, and otherwise, thank you for listening.